Spring 2009 on TSN is brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward. Uh, the sights and sounds of a classic car show. We've all been to one, but I'm here to tell you that this weekend on the Monterey Peninsula, this is simply nirvana for classic car lovers. This event is being held at the Quail Lodge in Carmel Valley, and later on the weekend, the famous Pebble Beach Concours. Now, you don't have to show me the money. I can smell it and believe me there's a lot of people who didn't fall for Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. There is simply millions and millions of dollars worth of some of the finest classic cars on this planet. And you know it would seem like an odd place to introduce a new car. Sure they've got fat wallets here but at $400 a pop everybody's kind of in the classic car mood but nonetheless Porsche has picked this spot to introduce the newest member to its showroom. As we all know Porsche is selling more Cayennes and 911 these days so I guess the thinking is maybe success will breed success so the car they're introducing this weekend is a sports car but it's for the family this is the first all-new Porsche in seven years the next big step in the company's evolution. It's a four-door, four-passenger. We're calling it a Gran Turismo because it's not quite a sedan, it has a hatchback. The anticipation is that it'll add about 20,000 units a year of sales globally. But really it's designed to attract a new customer to the Porsche brand, particularly a very high-end customer. Well, my first impression of the car was that it sort of looked like a hatchback four-door Corvette, uh, but uh, seeing the car in the flesh, it looks a lot different than it does in photos, and uh, from the little experience we had riding shotgun on the track this morning, it's definitely living up to the badge on the hood. I joined uh, Porsche in 2004, the project was just started and then you were asked to do a fourth model line. You can just start on a clean uh, piece of paper. So, I mean, these are very rare moments in a, in a career, in a designer's career. So I was completely excited. All of our cars, including the Cayenne, including the Panamera, really, you know, shine on the track. And we thought it was very important to show that this car is a real Porsche. It doesn't just look like one. Two different engines, there's a 4.8 liter V8 that's a 400 horsepower engine and a twin turbo version with a 500 horsepower engine. Both of them come with a seven speed PDK double clutch transmission and you can have in the base engine rear wheel drive or all wheel drive and the turbo is all wheel drive only. You know, if you have any doubt that this is a Porsche from the exterior, they disappear when you get behind the wheel. You would swear you're driving a 911. Five gauge instrument panel, ignition on the left. Now this is a four seater, not a five seater. Some people think it should be since it's being built as a sports car for the family. Heck, look at the back seat, buckets, that says Porsche. Bench seat and Porsche. No, they don't even go together. Now there's also a button for almost every function on this Panamera, but two I don't understand. One is for the engine auto off, which means your engine will shut down when you're at a stop to save fuel. Now my feeling is, turn this car on, it should default to the auto stop, but it doesn't, you have to engage it. The second one actually controls the sound of your exhaust. This is what it sounds like when it's on. And now off. Hello, what do you need this button for? Come on, the beauty of a Porsche is listening to the engine and I want to hear every note of those eight cylinders. There are guys that have loved, adored and lived with 911s but suddenly have a family. You know, they can't justify that car. They'll probably hang on with their kind of fingernails until the wife says, get rid of it. What the Panamera does, it allows them to justify having a Porsche in the garage. That's not an SUV. Look at the hip on this Panamera. Now that is the hip 
of a Porsche. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this weekend on the Monterey Peninsula, it is dedicated to celebrate the good old classic automobile. Yet Porsche has picked this venue to introduce the new Panamera. So I'm thinking, isn't this adding just a little pressure, not only on Porsche, but also on the man who designed this car? I don't really feel the pressure, I have to say. First of all, I've, I find it fits very well in this environment. And uh, my dream would be that uh, at the Concours d'Elegance in, in, in 20, 30, 40 years, uh, that uh, the Panamera is among the milestones of car history. Sometimes governments do things that are so stupid, they're shocking. More later on Kenzie's Corner. On this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the future of the automobile Mitsubishi style. Electric vehicles have not made inroads into the mainstream market for a number of reasons. Going into the test of the Mitsubishi i -Me, I half expected to run headlong into all of them, and if my worst fears were realized, find something akin to an overblown electric golf cart. Yes, this car has its limitations, but they stop well short of being described as hang-ups. Based on Mitsu's iCar, a diminutive sled that's just 3395 millimeters long, the iMe, which stands for Mitsubishi Innovative Electric Vehicle, well, it is just that, all electric. Now this being an electric vehicle, you do have to plug it in to recharge the main battery. Now if you plug it into a 110 volt outlet, it takes about 14 hours to completely recharge the battery. If you happen to have 220, which most households do because of the things like an electric stove, it halves the amount of charging time required, cuts it down to seven hours so you can get it done overnight very quickly. There is a third option and it's a three phase 200 volt quick charger, which will actually put about an 80% charge into this battery in 30 minutes. Now to give you some idea as to what you're talking about, this laptop battery is 10.8 volts and it's rated at 60 watt hours. This vehicle, well its battery is 330 volts and it puts out no less than 16,000 watt hours. That's why it takes time to charge. Obviously, the iMeV ranks as a zero emissions vehicle because it is an electric car. However, even when one factors in the CO2 footprint from the power stations that generate the electricity needed for the recharging process, the Mitsu still produces 70% fewer greenhouse gases than a similar gasoline-powered car. Right about now, we'd be showing you a pretty engine shot with me revving it up. When you open the hood of this vehicle, washer fluid, brake fluid, and of course the coolant for the battery. The electric motor on this vehicle is actually housed underneath the back end where it drives the rear wheels. Above that, you've got all of the power electronics that control everything on board the vehicle. The final part of the puzzle, well, that's the lithium ion battery. Now they've mounted it in the floor pan. That does one good thing. Because it's one of the heavier parts of the car, keeping it low down drops the center of gravity, which then improves the handling. Crank the iMeve to life and nothing seems to happen. Only a small green ready sign tells the driver the car is ready to roll. Shift into drive and the sound of silence ushers the car off the line with remarkable alacrity. True the 63 horsepower and 133 pound-feet of torque the electric motor generates does not seem like very much. However, as the electric motor develops peak torque from Rev 1, the iMeve picks up its little side sills and runs. It scoots to 80k in about 9 seconds. Now that's far from fast, but more than adequate to handle the cut and thrust of a morning commute. More impressive is the fact that the iMeve also turns the 80 to 120 trick in 10 seconds. Yes, an electric car that has the wherewithal to run at 120 kilometers an hour without missing a beat. The strange look flashed my way as I beetled by other motorists. Well, it said it all. Now, as you might imagine, the gauge cluster on this iMeve is a little different. You have something that actually looks like a fuel gauge. It actually tells you how much is left in the battery. There's also something that would normally be the speedo. It actually tells you if the electric motor is recharging the battery or driving the car. 
The rest of it is all logically laid out. Now, the other thing that I did find surprising, this car will actually hold four adults in comfort. There's plenty of room up front, and with the rear seats up, there's a little bit of cargo space. However, fold the split folding rear seats down and you more than double the cargo capacity. It really does have a lot of interior volume for such a small car. The iMeve also holds its own very nicely when driven in a normal manner. The ride is comfortable. The generous 1600mm wheelbase minimizes the choppiness that mars the smart car's ride, and there's little in the way of body roll. Likewise, the electric steering is light and precise at slow speeds, and it firms up nicely as the speeds rise. Push too hard, however, and the iMeve does slip into understeer in spite of its sensibly sized P17555R15 tires. And it all boils down to the lack of mass up front. Electric vehicles aren't without their shortcomings. First and foremost, the range, well, it typically means that you cannot use this vehicle as a primary mode of transportation. However, as a second car, this iMeve works exceptionally well. It's got a ton of pep, it handles nicely, and it's got decent room despite its diminutive dimensions. Now, for most people, because it will take you 120K in real-world driving, that's more than enough to take you to work and home again without having to recharge the battery. Now, if you think of this as the future, we've got a greener planet coming. Make sure you check out the Motoring website at motoringtv.com. You can watch any program you may have missed. In fact, how about a trip down memory lane and see what we were driving as far back as 1988. Check out our blog, our photo gallery, and much more. It's all there at motoringtv.com. British ceremony, as you know. It really is just the opulence. For, uh, Ralph Lauren has been known to spend $5 million on a car just to bring it here, just so that he can win first class in this. Once you've won first class at Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, your car can be worth millions more. Now, as I mentioned earlier, to attend this classic car show at the Quail Lodge in Carmel Valley, it's going to cost you $400 a head. But believe me, for these people, this is chump change. If somebody said, heck, I'd pay admission just to walk around the parking lot, and boy, are they right, look at some of these vehicles. But you know, I can't find a Honda Fit. Oh yeah, that's another life. As you know, the Honda Fit was our overall car of the year, and we've been doing a long-term test on this vehicle. And one, two things I really like about the Fit, I love the looks of it and the interior space. It's amazing when you consider how small this car is. But I do have a pet peeve that concerns the transmission. As we all know, Honda's big with the high revving engines, but I find when I'm at highway speeds with this five-speed manual, I'm looking for a sixth gear. Is that the answer, and is it that easy? Well, let's put that question to our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Probably not that easy, Brad, and I'm gonna give you some of the reasons why. First of all, I'm gonna preface this by saying I absolutely love a standard transmission car, especially a zippy, nimble little car like the Fit, or a sports car, a performance car like the 2010 Mustang beside me. These cars just beg, cry out for a manual transmission, and I absolutely covet a six-speed manual transmission. A Corvette with a six-speed would be my ultimate dream car, believe me. Having said that, though, I think there's probably a number of good reasons why the Honda engineers didn't include a six-speed with the fit. And I'm just going to speak for myself here. This is an educated guess, reading between the lines, however you want to put it. Let's face it, the fit's an entry-level car, okay? So a six-speed transmission costs more money to produce, and it's bulkier. So there's a packaging issue, and this is a physically small car in exterior dimensions with a lot of cargo capacity. Five passengers, pretty decent cargo capacity for a small car. And it's only got a 1.5 liter four-cylinder engine trying to drag that mass along with it. Now, I went to the driver's door and looked at the cargo capacity of this car, and it's 385 kilograms maximum. That's for passengers 
and their cargo. It has five seats in the car. That equates to 847 pounds. I can only think in terms of pounds when I'm weighing passengers and cargo. So 847 pounds, okay? Now if you put five big ugly guys like me in that car, do the math, we're at 1125 pounds. We're way over the cargo capacity of that car. We all know that we tend to overload things and we don't tend to adhere to specifications. And I'm sure that the engineers on this car figure out that sooner or later you're probably going to do that. So this car's got to be able to pull away and perform with that small engine, that 1.5 liter engine, all the cargo and, and passengers that this vehicle could have in it and give reasonable fuel economy and performance. They've got to factor these things all in and still keep the price right down. So the five speed is the logical way to go. And I think that's probably why. And Brad, I guarantee you the Honda engineers factored in everything and probably more than I mentioned when they made the selection of that tranny and they selected the one that they felt would work best for all those parameters. But you know what? If you wanted an entry level four cylinder car with a six speed, you could go and get a Nissan Versa. Bigger engine and a six speed manual and it's a lot more fun to drive. It's got a lot more grunt and Brad, you're right. It's nice to be able to bring the revs down when you pop it into sixth gear and reap that extra fuel economy. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2009. We're at the Quail, a motorsports event. Um, it's now, I think, in its seventh year. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being the MC for about the last five years. It, it's a great event here at Quail Lodge. Uh, it's next to the golf course, next to the resort, and it fits well into this week of activities on the Monterey Carmel Peninsula. I think the last time you and I met was in Detroit at the uh, North American International Auto Show and it was snowing and it was frosty and everybody was turned down expression. You know, we're here in Northern California, the weather is absolutely perfect, blue sky, with probably some of the greatest cars on the planet right here. This is almost like a, a huge garden party, if you like. A colleague of mine came from the UK to one of these a couple of years ago, and he said it's like an English garden party with 3,000 billionaires. Um, it certainly feels like that when you see some of the cars that are here. Clues in the title, it's a motorsports event. So these are cars that are driven by people. They're not, they're not as people used to call them, trailer queens. You know, these are cars that are used by people. You can actually smell the aroma of dollar bills coming here and uh, wonderful jewelry and diamonds or whatever. These are probably some of the wealthiest people on the planet that are here involved in this great show. They're either owners or they're lookers or buyers, but you know, this is the epicenter of the car world this weekend. Cars will come over from Laguna Seca, they'll drive over from Laguna, they're racing there, they'll drive here to show for a while, you know, have a couple of beers and go back. There's a common theme and that is this love of motor cars, history of motor cars and driving them. government is proposing a $10,000 subsidy for electric cars. Now this proposal is so stupid at so many levels I barely know where to begin. But let's begin with basic economics. Now if you accept that the free market system is the most efficient way to deliver goods and services to the buying public, and to paraphrase Winston Churchill, it's the worst system ever invented except for all the others, then all subsidies are by definition bad because they distort that market. Now I accept that the government has the right, maybe even the obligation, to nudge the market in certain directions. Maybe not the best example, but for example, they do require us to wear seat belts and the objective is to reduce hospital costs. Fair enough. But what objective are they trying to achieve with this subsidy? Are they trying to reduce the use of gasoline on our roads? That makes some sense. But is this the best way to do it? No, because they're betting on one particular technology. Maybe electric cars aren't the best answer. Maybe it's hybrids, maybe it's diesels. Maybe it's staying at home and commuting by your computer instead of commuting on our highways. You want to reduce the use of gasoline? I hate to say it again, raise the price. Let the market decide what the most efficient way to do it. 
not by subsidizing electric cars. Another thing, the only car that currently qualifies for this subsidy will be the Chevrolet Volt. Now, it's a great concept, an electric car with an onboard gasoline engine to extend the range, to automatically recharge that battery as required. But that car is going to cost somewhere between forty and fifty thousand dollars, and you're going to give people who can afford a car like that a ten thousand dollar tax break? That's the most regressive taxation policy you can possibly imagine. It's ludicrous. They'd be better off giving everybody a Hyundai Accent for ten thousand dollars. We'd reduce fuel a whole lot more by doing that. And there's another thing: General Motors is now partly owned by the Ontario government. This is why Toyota and Honda are complaining about this subsidy, although their hybrids are subsidized too, so maybe they're not in the best position to argue. What Ontario's doing is taking $10,000 out of your taxation money and putting part of it in their own pocket. You know, the one thing about common sense, it just isn't very common. I'm Jim Kinsey. You're looking at what they call the Porsche Zentrum here in Carmel Valley at the Classic Car Show. Now, just a few days ago, this was a field. They cleared the field, they planted the sod, and they built this thing in about 10 days. A lot of money, right? Well, think about this. The very first day it was open, Porsche sold 10 Panameras. And you're looking at a price, I'd say, about $150,000, so yes, this place was paid for. And you know, they're projecting 20,000 sales of the Panamera globally. I think if they hang around here long enough, they can sell them all. Now, I've always been a Porsche fan since my first dinky toy. Loved the 911. Yes, I was shocked when they brought in the Cayenne, but hey, it's been a big success. So the Panamera, yes, it's different. Yes, it's got four doors, and it is a sports car for the family. The bottom line, when you get in this car and drive it, the Porsche DNA is there. You can bet your boots that Graham Fletcher is just dying to get behind the wheel of one of these on a future test drive for a much closer look. So make sure you join us for that and much more as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. We just couldn't be any happier and I'm honored to have the first one and the second one and uh, I'm going to put them with some of the other cars I have restored and travel around the country with them. So uh, this is a really exciting day. I've been waiting a long time for this. Motoring 2009 on TSN has been brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.